Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of A View from Earth, the official podcast of the Fisk Planetarium at the University of Colorado in Boulder. As always, I am Tara. I'm a planetary scientist and a CU alum, uh, also a presenter at Fisk, host of the podcast, outreach coordinator, all that fun stuff. And as always, Colin is here, too. Hey, everyone. It's me, Colin. I am an undergrad at CU studying astrophysics and computer science. And uh, I also co-host this podcast and do shows when the planetarium is open for business. Yay. And we have our producer, John, too. He's always hiding in the background. Hi, Hi. John. Hi. Hi. So today we are talking with uh, Chris Sherpenseal, also known as Sherp. Super cool guy. He does astrophotography. Uh, so this is a little bit different than some people might think of. A lot of people, they hear astrophotography, they think of, you know, the telescope set up with the camera and you're taking pictures of nebulas and planets and stuff like that. But Sherp actually does more of a uh, camera-based photography, not so much with the telescope, but just using a regular DSLR, which we found stands for Digital Single Lens Reflex Camera, aka just a regular camera, you know, the kind that professional people use. Um, so doing more like that and still taking pictures of the night sky, stars, and especially the Milky Way and cool stuff like that. So it was really fun to talk to him. Um, I feel like I learned a lot about photography. Well, and he had a lot of insights, I think, that you typically wouldn't get unless you, you spoke to someone about astrophotography for the reason of learning their insights, you know? So like one of the things I thought was cool and that you kind of started to touch on is the difference between astrophotography and deep sky photography. Before this interview, those were the same thing in my head. And it turns out astrophotography, like you said, Tara, refers to kind of the landscape of the sky, the skyscape, if you will. Um, whereas deep sky photography, like you said, is, is you know, for deep sky objects, like nebulas and, and planets and galaxies and other such things. So that's yeah. kind of cool. I thought the exact same thing. I was thinking of the camera on the telescope and taking pictures like that. So I did want to uh, address one question that we had. We had someone come through with a question for Capcom from, uh, this is Brandon from Furlong, who was asking about non-visible light photography, which is not Sherp's thing. He does just, again, the DSLR photos with visible light. And they don't really have the technology, apparently, to do non-visible light with just a DSLR camera, which I think is too bad. And they should get on that because that would be super cool. <laughs> I want to take pictures in infrared. <laughs> they being the digital camera industry. They. Get on it. <laughs> yes. Nikon and yes. Canon. Big what camera out there needs yeah. to get on this. Yeah. Um, but Brandon wanted to know about um, how to decide what colors to use when you're doing non-digital or non-visible light. And that's something we do with telescopes a lot. And this is one thing that I got to experience in a class that I took, an observations class that I took um, at CU. We use the Summers Bosch Observatory and their big uh, telescope there to take pictures of uh, the, the Sol Nebula. Ooh. Sol as in sun or Sol as in like spirit? As in like heart and soul. It's right next oh, to nice. the heart nebula. Oh. <laughs> so there's the heart nebula and the soul nebula, which is super cute. They'll yeah, I know. It looks, I don't know if it looks like a soul or not. Yeah, what does a soul <laughs> Hard to look say. like? <laughs> I, I don't know. It's real pretty. Um, but that's something that we did because most telescopes don't take visible light pictures. Like there's no color to it. It's just mm. black and white most of the time. And so the pictures are artificially colored. And uh, we found through our experience and through asking around that you just pick a lot of times. Sometimes people will try to do it uh, spectroscopically, like, oh, hydrogen has spectral lines that are red, so all of the hydrogen features we're going to make red. Mm -hmm. And then oxygen is blue, so we're going to make all the oxygen-rich features blue and stuff like that. So they'll right. do it that way. But a lot of times it's just randomly just picked. Choose. Yeah. That's why I love looking at pictures of like infrared shots. I have some of Jupiter where Jupiter is like this crazy aquamarine color with orange and purple stripes and it looks <laughs> awesome, <laughs> but yep. it's nothing like what you would actually see in the sky. Well, I think that's kind of a, I've always been somewhat perturbed by this, you know, by that practice, not be, not at the fault of the astronomer because it's, it's non-visible light, you know, you can't see it unless you, you somehow colorize it, right? Right. And, but I've always just kind of been like, man, like if, if somehow I was able to look at, you know, this nebula 
for real with my naked eye, like if I could, if I could get in a ship and, and go there, it, it wouldn't look anything like this. And so, so I've always kind of felt like I'm like, oh, I, I feel somehow like I'm being deceived, even though that doesn't matter because I'm never going to see it with, you know, I'm only ever going to see pictures that people take in color eyes. But I don't know, do either of you get that feeling sometimes you're just like, man, like, this is super cool, but I know I'm, I'm not seeing the real thing as far as color goes. I don't know. Sometimes, yes. I I think I feel more bad about it when people like call it out. Mm. Like when they first released the pictures of Jupiter's North Pole and it's bright blue and everybody's like, oh my God, Jupiter's blue. And I got to yep. well, yeah, it is blue. It's totally blue. It's, it's not this like radioactive teal color that right. you see a lot of those pictures. They, di they dialed the contrast way up, but it's totally blue. I swear. Right. And then right. they're, you know, they see the actual pictures and they're way less enthused. Yeah. But man, it's great for an outreach tool though, to get people excited to, you know, really make these things pop and use a little bit of artistic license at the same time. Well, and it, it, I think that opens the door to a conversation about why is it blue, right? Wow, I can see that this part of this thing on the top of Jupiter is so blue. Why is that, right? And maybe mm -hmm. someone wouldn't ask that question if it weren't quite as blue. So like you said, yeah, I think that is there's definitely value in, in sparking people's curiosity, even if it yeah. at the end of the day is, you know, deceptive in one way or another. Right. And that's really why we do it from a science standpoint, too, is to really, because it is made of something entirely different and that's why it's a different color and by cranking up those contrasts or really playing with that sort of thing it gives us a lot of insight yeah. into what's going on you know if you don't really you know mess with like the I don't know the word I'm looking for I forget um, but like being able to see real definition in clouds and stuff on Jupiter mm -hmm. or you know being able to make out surface features on Mars sometimes you really have to play with the image a little bit to really get those things to pop and right. sometimes it just ends up looking way cooler and so those are the images that we publish but right. I don't think that's any any fault of science per se yeah we're not yeah. trying to trick anybody cool well, I think uh, I think we are at the point where we can jump right in. Let's do it. Sherp, tell us about some astrophotography. Sounds good. And now we are joined by Chris Sherpenseal, who was born and raised in Colorado. At the age of 14, he traveled to New Zealand to live with his father. Seeing the natural beauty of another country sparked his interest in travel and photography. And while attending the University of Colorado at Boulder, his interest in passion in astronomy was fueled by courses taken in astrophysics. Today, as a night sky photographer, he uses his camera to capture epic landscapes and legendary skies. Sherp, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So I guess first things first, when and how did you get into photography and particularly astrophotography? Well, I first started uh, with photography when I was an undergraduate at the University of Colorado. And I shot with film. Uh, black and white, tried to do my own development, and I must tell you, I was not very successful. Uh, made a ton of mistakes, and uh, after many, many years in his digital photography in the early 2000s started to take off, that really piqued my interest in, in pursuit of trying to become better. But specifically as it relates to astrophotography, I really started in about 2013, so about eight years ago. And that, you know, from your bio, this was this was fueled by the courses you were taking at CU in astrophysics, or or did, did it go the other way around that you were kind of interested and you started taking these courses, you know, as a result of your, you know, interest in in picturing the skies. Yeah. No, I think my interest, Colin, first started as a young boy, just the interest in outer space and space, as most people have a fascination with the stars and planets and universe. Um, but I think, yeah, that passion started to grow as I got into college and certainly the University of Colorado um, has a tremendous astrophysics department. And for a business major, it was very intriguing for me to get some exposure to astronomy and uh, pursue that hobby, if you will. So that was really my first foray into astrophysics and astronomy. 
very cool. So uh, tell us a little bit about the kinds of equipment that you normally use to do your astrophotography. If anybody is watching the video version here, you can see some of these amazing pictures behind him here. Uh, how, how, what do you do to make this happen? What sort of stuff do you need? Yeah, well, today's uh, equipment is so much more sophisticated than we had even a decade ago. Um, the quality of uh, uh, digital photography is phenomenal, but you, normally what I shoot with is a digital SLR, and uh, you know it could be any brand. I actually happen to shoot with Canon, um, but obviously everybody has their own preference, whether it's Nikon or Sony or whatever. Um, and I typically shoot with wide angle lenses. So wide angle being anywhere from about 14 millimeter all the way up to 35 millimeter. That gives you an opportunity to capture a significant portion of the night sky and also do stitching, which would allow you to, uh, to increase the size of your images and do more panoramic type photography. So that's a big part of the equipment that I use. Did it take you a while to sort of build up a collection of all of this stuff? Or did you just kind of go out and get everything in one big chunk? Yeah, Jared, it's, uh, you build it over time. As most people know, if they have any interest in photography, the equipment can be very, very expensive. And I don't necessarily recommend that to people that you go out and buy the most expensive equipment. You know, I think there's an awful lot of good used equipment out there, both lenses and cameras and tripods and all of the accessories that you need to be able to shoot the night sky. And I think that's a great way to get into, you know, the hobby and start to develop your craft. Um, but yeah, you can go as expensive or as inexpensive as you uh, as you choose. What would you consider like the basics of what you would need? Say if somebody wanted to get started in astrophotography, what are like the essentials that they would need to have? Well, the first thing that I would recommend, and it actually has nothing to do with specific equipment, it would be uh, understanding the night sky and being able to understand the constellations, you know, from the geography that you're located in. So that could be a star map or it could be an application on an iPhone or, you know, something like that. Um, there are a number of applications like Stellarium uh, is a good example, or Sky Guide is another, um, Photo Pills is a third. All of those are great applications to really kind of learn the night sky. Uh, and I would highly recommend that to people before they start making an investment. It makes things so much easier as you start to think about interesting objects that you want to shoot and understanding, um, you know, the stars and how, uh, how they move through the night sky. Once you do that, the next thing I would say is then, then you start to move into, okay, what's my budget? What can I afford? And obviously, uh, you know, having good equipment matters. I mean, in today's day and age, um, the quality of the sensor that you buy or camera that you buy, certainly having good lenses is important to capture. You have to have a really good tripod, um, something that's stable because obviously the earth is moving and stars move relatively quickly. So those are key key elements. And do you use, what I, could, I guess I should say, when you go out to take photos, you mentioned using these apps, right? These planetarium apps that kind of, you know, tell you where stuff is and where it's going. Yeah. How, what's an example of how you might use one of these applications to guide your photography? Well, a big part of photographing the night sky um, very candidly is understanding the location you want to shoot it from. And so having applications that have GPS capability, so even before you get to the location and to, with today's apps, you have the ability to, you know, get a pretty good idea as to what the night sky is going to look like from a particular location, how the stars are going to move through the sky um, throughout the night. And then you can start to do a lot of planning. That's another key element, Colin, that a lot of people, um, and they want to rush out and they want to start shooting beautiful pictures of the sky. And my recommendation would be, well, you need to know what objects you want to shoot, and at what time of night and what time of year are those visible. So it's very similar to like planning scientific observations in that way. We have to do the same thing when we're requesting our telescope time. You know, you got to plan it out like that. No question. And in fact, any really uh, uh, strong photographer, professional photographer that does landscape or night sky photography will tell you that planning is probably the most important facet of it, even beyond the equipment. And they will oftentimes share with you that they will revisit the exact same location many, many times to get it the way that they want to capture it in their mind's eye. So speaking of planning, I imagine that having a good sky, you know, is a big part of, of getting these shots, right? Part of that being a dark enough sky. I think 
anyone that's been to the planetarium has had our light pollution demo and how you know much of the sky light pollution obscures. So how do you, you know, how does how does light pollution factor into your work in astrophotography? And I guess a, a, another question related to that is how far must you travel to get the sky's dark that, that <laughs> you know you can do your photography? Yeah, Colin, it's a great question. You know, I think first and foremost, it does come back to the planning side of things, and you do have to do some scoping on where can you find dark skies. And as we all know, it's getting harder and harder to do as um, cities become larger. Uh, certainly, you look at the Denver, Boulder, Fort Collins area, Colorado Springs, it gets a little more difficult, but not impossible. And I always encourage people um, to think, you know, multi-directionally, because you can go north all the way to Wyoming or Montana. You know, you certainly can go out to the eastern plains of Colorado and shoot dark skies and find dark skies. Most people, when they think about finding a location, think of the mountains for obvious reasons. And there are some terrific night sky locations in the mountains. And then certainly we we're blessed with the ability to go if we're interested all the way far south to the Colorado and New Mexico border. So directionally, we're fortunate. But to answer your question more specifically, I would say most of the time you need to get about two to two and a half hours away from the city of Denver in order to be able to get some skies locally that will be suitable for what you want to shoot. Are you comfortable sharing what one of your favorite locations to shoot from is? Oh, sure. Happy to happy to do so. Um, you know, we, my wife and I are very blessed that we own some property down in Westcliff, Colorado. Most people say they have no idea where Westcliff is. And uh, I would tell you it's about an hour directly west of Pueblo, just on the west side of the San Isabel National Forest and at the base of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. It also happens to be a night uh, dark sky location. So it's a very good location um, to be able to do capture. and. Uh, so that's certainly one of our favorites because we have some property there. But aside from that, um, Rocky Mountain National Park in our backyard from Boulder, not too far away, is a terrific location as well. And the third place that I would bring to a lot of people's attention that they're not as familiar with is Dinosaur National Monument. Happens to be in the northwest corner of the state. It's about five hours away from Denver and Boulder. It is a terrifically dark sky location. That's perfect. So, Thank you. Oh, so did you buy the property because it's a great photography location or did it happen the other way around? Uh, it, it was a combination of things. <laughs> if you were to ask my wife, she would say that um, dark sky location factored very heavily into the decision making. But uh, the beauty is truly unparalleled. If, if uh, people have an opportunity, if they haven't gone down to the Sanger de Cristo Mountains and seen that mountain range, it's stunningly beautiful. I'm curious, do you and your wife do any mountain climbing or, or uh, you know, other sort of, of outdoor recreation being so close to the Sangre de Cristos there? We like to hike. That's an important um, thing for us to be able to do. And as we get older, it gets a little more difficult. We're not quite as mobile as we used to be. But yeah, I think, you know, for me in particular, and because I like to, to do night sky photography and landscape photography, the ability to hike and enjoy the outdoors is an important element of it. Um, I'm not a skier. I'm a rather tall individual, so uh, I'm, I'm kind of like a giraffe on skis, so I don't ski or snowboard. Um, but, uh, but yeah, enjoying the outdoors is an important element of the overall experience. I imagine you have to frequently hike to some of these dark skies and carry tripods and cameras and equipment and all of that with you. No question, Sarah. And it, and it varies by location, you know. Uh, it really depends on where you're shooting from. There are some locations that you could park your car on the side of the road and you can jump out and you can get some terrific images. And then other locations, yeah, it's a hike. If you go into uh, Utah, for example, at Arches and Canyonlands, um, beautiful locations, lots of great locations to shoot night sky photography from. Many of those can be a couple of miles of hike. And, you know, you're doing it in the dark, right? And so, you know, there are some considerations related to safety that you have to be cognizant of. So I'm curious, if you are planning to shoot from a spot that requires kind of a hike to get to, that's not, you know, a paved road or even a feasible dirt road to get there, would you personally plan to show up while it's still light and then do your hike in the day and then wait it out until it turns to night? Or is it, you know, generally the practice that you just kind of show up, you know, with the amount of time that you need to set up, if, even if that includes hiking in the dark to your to your location? Yeah, I don't recommend just showing up in the dark. <laughs> I think there are too many 
concerns and variables uh, that people need to be cognizant of. And I would say, Colin, safety is a very important consideration, right? And I, and I actually believe that, that the vast majority of locations that, that I would go to and shoot are very safe locations. You don't have to worry about bad things happening. But accidents do happen, right? I mean, you could trip and fall or you could get hurt somehow or you could encounter, you know, uh, bears or mountain lions or something like that. So safety is number one. And I guess what I would, would suggest to people is this is also a hobby that while I know photographers do on their own and they will go out at night and they will go to remote locations, I would highly recommend that you do it with other people. Do it as part of a workshop, do it with friends that have a passion for photography. It makes the entire experience so much more enjoyable. And then it adds an element of safety in case something were to happen. Can you recommend any sort of uh, like groups, you know, I don't know, Facebook groups or, or list serves to anyone that might be interested, you know, of photographers that might go do trips together? Well, first and foremost, Colin, there are a number of workshops that professional photographers offer. And all you have to do is a search on the web related to night sky photography, and there will be tons that will pop up. It's become a very popular way for professional photographers to share their craft and frankly, to make a living because it's difficult in today's day and age um, to, to just do photography and sell your prints, even though a lot of photographers do. They have to supplement that more often than not with things like workshops and training videos and those kinds of things. Um, probably the most notable though that I can share with you, for, if people might be interested in listening to the cast is um, the Nightscaper Conference. The Nightscapers is uh, a group of professional photographers, usually they meet on an annual basis in early June or late May um, in Southern Utah. And uh, they do that because obviously it's close to a number of national parks and a number of state parks that are great locations for night sky photography. There's a ton of different uh, courses that can be taken. This year, because of the pandemic, um, it's going to be a remote conference. And so there's about 30 different professional photographers that will be teaching. Um, at that particular session, but it'll all be Zoom, you know, related, that sort of uh, presentation. Got it. And hey, before we get too far away, I, there was actually a question I wanted to ask that we kind of uh, <laughs> started talking about some other things. And I was just curious, are there any cases where light pollution can be a benefit to your photography? Do you ever use it to your advantage? Yeah, you know, here's the thing. We, we typically don't have perfect locations that are pitch black right? Unless you're in a very, very dark location. Um, so you do deal with light pollution. And even when you move a couple of hours away, say, to do a photo shoot from Denver or Colorado Springs or wherever, more often than not on the horizon in some direction, you're going to be battling a little bit of light pollution. And so you do have to tend to work with it. Um, I'm actually going to be doing a photo shoot later in August of this year down at the uh, Great Sand Dunes National Monument. And we'll be shooting to the south in southwest and southeast direction because we want to capture the night sky and in particular the galactic center of the Milky Way. But what you will see in the distance is some light coming off of Alamosa um, and some of the other cities down in that part of the state. And so, yeah, you work with it a little bit, you try to make sure it complements and it's part of the overall composition that you capture. And do you ever try to remove it you know, in your, in your editing after you've taken the photos? Is that a, a practice to try and somehow get rid of the light pollution in your photo? Or is it generally left there as kind of a signature of the space that you were shooting in? You know, I have never taken out um, using Photoshop or any other photo editors, any uh, light pollution per se. The bigger thing that you tend to do, and again, not to get too far off topic here, is that, uh, you know, what oftentimes happens is you get noise, what's known as noise in your dark sky images. And noise has to do more with dialing up the sensor to, because we're shooting small points of light in the sky. And when you do that, you start to um, introduce artifacts into the image that you want to be able to, to eliminate. And so there are techniques that you can use to do that. But more specific to your question, you know, I can't think of any situations where I've removed light pollution or attempted to remove light pollution. If anything, I've tried to utilize it as a complementary piece to the overall composition and capture. So this is a little bit different than, say, somebody who's wanting to take, do astrophotography, say, with a telescope or something. That's going to be a totally different situation, right? It's yeah, Taryn, it's, it's the same principles, okay? Whether you're shooting through the scope 
which is deep sky photography. And I have friends that do that. Um, or whether you're shooting more Milky Way, which is just on a tripod, right? And using more wide angle type lenses. The philosophy and the techniques are almost identical. You're just using more powerful lenses, or in this case, the telescope to shoot as though it is the lens. Um, I personally have not done any deep sky photography, although I'm about to. It's kind of the next evolution in my photography. And I happen to have a very good friend down in Westbrook that has his own observatory and has some pretty sophisticated equipment. So I will be able to leverage some of that to do some of the work that I want to do. But um, that is even more advanced than typical night sky photography where you're just setting up a camera on a tripod and trying to capture the Milky Way. So speaking of technology and stuff, you said normally you shoot with the fancy DLR or DSLR and stuff like that. Um, but I've seen a lot of things recently, especially with some of the, astron the astronomical things that have been happening, people uh, just wanting to take these pictures with their phones and things like that. Do you think that uh, phone cameras, I mean, they're getting super advanced now. Do you think they're ever going to be advanced enough to be able to do this sort of night sky photography like you're doing with your DSLR? Yeah, I don't think there's any question that the uh, continual progression of technology will enable that. And I, and I don't think it's that far away. I think certainly in the next five years or so, you could see some situations where you can capture the night sky or, um, you know, celestial objects with a cell phone. I mean, if we're virtually there now. And the technology there is almost identical to what we have in DSLR cameras where you have a chip a sensor, if you will, that captures those, those photons coming through the camera. Um, the challenge is going to be, and again, I think it's certainly something that will be solved, is when you hold a camera, excuse me, when you hold a cell phone, for example, and you point it at the sky, whether you realize it or not, you're moving. The earth is moving and you're moving. And so the one thing you can't solve for in photography is blur. You can fix a lot of things with photo editors, but you can't typically fix blur. And so that's probably the one thing that will be a bit of a hindrance for people that want to take exposures uh, with a cell phone and have it um, produce at a level of quality and a sharpness that they would want to see. But yeah, I believe that will, that will happen in the not too distant future. So say with the right tripod or whatever they need for stabilization, do you, do you ever see phones sort of cornering the market on this sort of thing? Or is there always going to be that attraction to having a box that you can hold in your hands kind of thing? It depends on if you're a traditionalist. If you're a traditionalist, yeah, you want to hold something that's a little bigger and beefier and something that perhaps you have the ability to change lenses with. I mean, that's probably another limitation of the cell phone is that you'll be able to do some level of magnification or telephoto capability, but it won't be as robust as you would be able to do with a digital SLR. Um, so yeah, it's like anything. You know, if you grew up using older equipment, um, you have a fondness for that. You probably struggled through it. You've learned how to utilize that equipment and you want to continue to leverage that knowledge. But uh, I think for somebody who is very comfortable using cell phone technology and as it continues to advance, I think it will enable them to do some pretty amazing things that, um, that we're just starting to see, you know, the very beginning of. So I'm curious, you know, we've talked about how, you know, your work in astrophotography, something like deep sky photography with a telescope and, uh, or, you know, telescopic kinds of instruments. Yes. And, and then, you know, data collection as, as, you know, if the purpose of the observation is for data collection, all kind of follow similar paths, right? They all require planning, they require the use of this technology to get you know, photos and, and in astronomy, you know, the data for those listening is pretty much just a photo, right? It's a photo and then we analyze the photo and that's that's how we do it. I'm curious, Sherp, if your work has ever been used for academic purposes, if someone has ever taken, you know, a shot of yours and, and kind of analyzed it or used the photo as a data set. And I'm also curious if you're if you're familiar, uh, what is required that beyond what you're doing for you know, research or academic purpose photos of the night sky? Yeah, I'm not directly aware of any of the images that I've taken being used for scientific purposes. And not that they couldn't be, but they certainly weren't shot um, calling from the vantage point of this is for a scientific purpose. Uh, you know, I, I'd be honored if that were the case, but in all candor, that hasn't been. Um, it is interesting, and I will share with you that uh, 
that, uh, you know, some of the professors that I've worked with over the years are known at the University of Colorado, um, have, uh, have often looked at my images and identified various objects and kind of they could tell the placement of where, you know, this, this was probably shot from in order at least time of year when it was captured. Um, you know, John Keller is a good example of that. Every time he looks at my images, um, he, you know, starts to identify various components or various objects. But no, I haven't spent any time doing the scientific or research side of it. It would be an area of interest if there were specific projects, for example, that um, various professors at, uh, at CU or other universities were interested in, you know, it would be something that I would find quite, quite interesting to do and be happy to participate in. But up to this point in time, there really hasn't been any. And are you familiar with, you know, it, say someone did approach you and say, hey, you know, you, I see that you take some great shots of the night sky, these, these, you know, I, I, I'm curious if I could use this as some sort of for academic reasons, you know, for research. Would you, do you anticipate that that, you know, would require that you change the way that you're taking these shots? I guess another way of asking this question is, are research purposed shots, so to speak, uh, much different than what you're doing, or is it really all about just the intention? I don't think there's any difference, candidly, between the two. I mean, I, I think there's obviously, uh, from my vantage point, the artistic element of capturing the night sky. And part of the reason, Colin, that I get into this was that I know there are a number of people that are not going to be up between midnight and 4 a.m., right? They're just not going to go out. I mean, just as a quick aside, it's dark, it's cold, you know, you're hungry, you're tired, you're sleepy. And most people don't want to deal with that, right? But, um, you know, I think from a scientific standpoint, you know, I look at that and I say, if there's an intended purpose, I think the capture would be almost identical to the artistic side of it. And I think there are probably researchers that would like to have access to some of the kinds of images that, you know, any kind of professional photographer can shoot and capture. Um, but it does come back to the things we talked about earlier, right? Planning what that object is. You know, what time of the year is it visible? Is it visible from where we are in a particular location? Or do we have to travel a significant distance to be able to capture things? Um, those are all important elements, I guess, between scientific and the artistic side of things. And just from a scientific standpoint, I'm thinking, you know, it's so hard to get telescope time sometimes to actually get the images that you need. Having the ability to use an astrophotographer instead seems like it'd be a lot I don't want to, I don't know about easier, but definitely easier to schedule. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's no question, uh, Tara. You know, a number of years ago, I went to Kitt Peak National Observatory, which is about an hour to an hour and a half, as you probably know, directly west of Tucson, and uh, spent the night there, actually, and worked with a, with a professional uh, astronomer. They actually had an amateur night sky where you could uh, program, where you could spend the night. You could actually shoot on top of the mountain using one of their reflector telescopes. And I forget the size. I want to say it was like a 24 inch. So it was a pretty good size telescope. And they had their own CCD collector on the back of it. So you could capture um, the night sky. That was a great experience for me. Um, and it really, I think, in many respects, helped fuel my, my continued interest in, in outer space and, and capture. Um, but today, you know, I would say, um, a big part of my focus is, is trying to just enjoy the night sky and to try to share that as much as I possibly can with a variety of people. And like I said earlier, people that I know are never going to go to Yellowstone National Park and in the middle of the night at two o'clock in the morning be shooting the Milky Way. <laughs> it's just not something most people are going to do. So where would you uh, send those people if, you, if they wanted to see some of your work? Is there anywhere that you're displaying or available? Do you have a website or something like that? Yeah, um, I've been very fortunate over the years. Um, my work has been displayed in a number of uh, locations. For a while, it was in Littleton Museum in an art show. Uh, it was also at Lone Tree Arts Center um, down here in, in the Denver area. Um, Goodson Rec Center is another location. Fisk Planetarium is another where I've had a number of my images on display. Uh, I used to uh, uh, sell my work in Gallery 873 in St. George, Utah. Um, and then today, most of my work is sold online through my website, which is uh, www.skypanoramics.com. And Sky Panoramics is a little bit of a unique spelling. It's S-K-Y-P-A-N-O 
R-A-M-I-X.com, skypanoramics.com. We'll add that link to our description so everybody can find it for you. Yeah, that's great. So well, I'm curious, when someone goes to purchase one of your shots, mm -hmm. do you do you print only on one medium? Is that predetermined? Or may customers choose, hey, I want this on canvas or metal or you know, just your standard photo paper? Yeah, uh, in my case, I actually have a printer that I use, a professional printer here in the Denver area, and they do a phenomenal job. They print on all sorts of media. So um, most people usually shoot on can or excuse me, print on canvas or acrylic. Um, those are probably the two most popular, but yeah, certainly brushed aluminum is another option. And then there's something known as a plaque mount, which is a, another alternative. Um, but yeah, when you go to my website, if you see an image that you like, the first thing that usually people will say is, um, how big can I enlarge this or how big can I get it? And the next question is, what are the medium choices? And so I try to give them some perspective on that. Um, but yeah, it's a little bit of a process. A lot of professional photographers call them, they will print their own. They have their own printers. Um, if they have the right quality of paper, they can produce their own images and they might sell on Facebook or you know one of the other social media outlets, Instagram or one of those. I have not gone to that extent because for me, that's not the focus of what I'm doing, right? Not that it's anything wrong with it. It's just not something that I tend to pursue. And there is kind of this thing that I always tell people because they want to know, do, do you do this for a living? And the answer is no, if I did, I'd be a starving artist. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I've sold a number of my images in large media. I've sold a number of images online. But what I tell people is, I think you fundamentally have to decide what's the purpose. What are you doing this for? Are you doing it to make money? And if you are, that's fine. You know, you're a professional photographer then and you get all the joys and challenges that come with it. Uh, if you do it more like me, and I would consider myself more of an, a, an advanced hobbyist, I do it because I want to share my work in a variety of um, locations and, you know, see if other people enjoy it as much as I did capturing it. I remember the ones we had hanging at Fisk, I think were printed on aluminum and people would walk up and kind of tap at it. And I always thought that was fascinating to print on metal like that. It's really unique. Yeah, I think there were some metal images and there are also some acrylics and acrylics tend to look a lot like glass. Um, it's probably the most popular medium, Tara, and uh, it also tends to be the heaviest and the most expensive. But when it's produced correctly, um, the images just pop because you get tremendous clarity and sharpness in the image. And that really matters with night sky because you're looking at a lot of tiny little dots, right? You're looking at stars uh, and, and you want to make sure that the clarity is as good as possible. With something like acrylic or glass, do they ever do sort of like layered printing to where it gives it like a 3D effect almost? I've heard of that. I have not explored that as an option. Um, I can only say that, again, it's probably like the evolution of when you shoot images with a cell phone, right? Night sky images with a cell phone. I have to believe that that element of dimension associated with layering will be the next evolution. Um, and I've heard of some work being done in that space, but I personally have not produced anything in that particular medium. I'm curious, Sherp, what is your preferred medium for prints in your home? That you put up on your own walls? Well, if you talk to my wife, it's canvas. <laughs> and, and for me personally, it really is acrylic. And I do like metal as well. I do like brushed aluminum. Um, I think they're, those mediums lend themselves well to night sky photography. I think the images have a tendency to pop. On canvas, you have the ability to really enlarge images significantly larger than you can do typically on uh, a more demanding medium like acrylic. There, it's a little more forgiving. It's got a little more texture to it. It hides some of the noise that exists in all night sky images. And so it gives you a little more latitude and flexibility there. Um, but it really is, you know, what is uh, beauty in the eye of the beholder, right? It just, everybody's different and everybody likes different mediums. So now I'm curious, do you have a favorite celestial object to shoot? Is there a, a place in the sky that you're always pointing your camera at? Yeah, I tend to gravitate back to the Milky Way. I tend to try to capture the galactic center. And uh, it, it is, if you look at most night sky images of the Milky Way, you typically see a very similar pattern or the same pattern of stars. Um, some very distinct elements in that particular portion of the sky. 
it's interesting. We're right at the time of the year where the Galactic Center is starting to become visible here from the Denver area. Uh, you know, it, it typically gets higher in the sky as we get later into the spring and the summer, and then it starts to recede again as we get into the fall, and usually by about the middle part of October, it's no longer visible. Um, but that said, you know, I love shooting pictures of the moon. Um, it's a great object. It's so bright, and uh, it's something everybody can identify with. And one of the personal things that I've uh, kind of dedicated myself to this year is doing more night sky photography involving the moon and various foreground objects, whether it's mountains or rivers or, um, you know, arches, those kinds of things, the desert. I'm actually going to be doing a photo shoot here in about two months down in Tucson. So we'll see. We'll see if we can get some cool capture from, from that trip. Have you ever traveled like a good distance away to try to get the Milky Way maybe from a, dis a different view, like way down south, perhaps, or something like that? Yeah, you know, um, let's talk about a far distance. So the farthest distance that I've traveled for a specific photo shoot was Iceland. And I would tell the listeners to this particular uh, podcast, it is the most amazing place to visit that I've ever been. And I've traveled a lot worldwide. I worked for Microsoft for a number of years. And I was very fortunate in my career that I got to see a lot of different countries and a lot of different places in the world. But for a night sky photographer, there is nowhere like Iceland. Um, it was the farthest distance I traveled. The night sky, we were very fortunate we were there. Out of the seven or eight nights we were there, we probably got clear skies four or five of those nights. And that can be a rarity because Iceland can really get some, some serious weather and a lot of clouds and rain. Um, Obviously, a lot of people like to go to Iceland because they're interested in, you know, capturing the northern lights. And that was a big part of our trip. So you kind of have to do some planning around that as well. And we did, right? We went in the fall where your chances of seeing the northern lights are much greater. If you try to go in the summer when the weather is warmer, you're not going to see the northern lights because it's daylight almost 24 hours a day. So those are the kinds of things that, uh, that you think about when you start planning. Um, Tara, domestically in the U.S., you know, I've traveled, you know, throughout the desert southwest. Um, it's dry climate. It makes it easier to capture as opposed to battling, you know, humidity and those kinds of things. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in Utah, a lot of time in Wyoming and Montana, um, obviously Arizona. You know, I, just various portions of the southwest. I had a trip planned this past year to go to Big Bend National Park, but unfortunately that got canceled because of the pandemic. Um, and this coming fall, I'll be headed to Maine. So hopefully we'll get some good capture there. I like this. Like the more that you talk about these things, it's so much like we do with telescopes and observing. It's the exact same things. We love going to Iceland and Svalbard and stuff like that. And then out into the desert. It's very, very similar. I think that's really cool. Yeah. And I think the key thing there is to, when you're a photographer, you really want interesting foreground, foreground objects. Um, it's, you know, again, most people think, wow, I just want to take a really cool picture of the night sky. But what also makes it interesting is when you start to capture interesting foreground objects, whether it is the mountains or an arch or rivers or, you know, snow-capped mountains or whatever, it just adds a totally different element to, um, to the image. And so as you get more experience and the people on this particular podcast, as they listen, if they're interested in this space, I think there's a huge element associated with composition that you start to learn more and more about and how important it is to really capture something the way you want to capture it. Do you think that makes it a little more, I don't know, grounding or relatable to people when they see these things? It's not just like a Hubble picture, which there's a galaxy, but it's like, this is actually a place here on earth that I could go see. Yeah, I think it's relatable, right? People see a picture with a um, really cool foreground and they can relate to it. And in many instances, people that buy images from me have been to the location that I shot from. So it means something to them. When they see a picture that I've taken up at Bear Lake and Rocky Mountain National Park, they've been there, or they've hiked around there, or they took their dog there or whatever, right? And, uh, and I would say the same when, when people see images um, that I've shot in, in Canyonlands or in Arches National Park, they've been there and it meant something to them. So yeah, there's the relatable element to it. And I just think it makes it more interesting. And when I first experimented, I was shooting a lot of pictures of stars and they're pretty, but that's it, right? There's nothing that distinguishes it tremendously, makes it tremendously different from something else until you start to add some interesting foreground elements to it. So that's a big part of it for me. 
it's almost like a postcard, a digital postcard. Yeah, no question. No question. And when you first start doing a lot of night sky photography, the other thing I would add to that is, you know, you're so focused on the technical aspect. Am I capturing it correctly? Am I able to get the image in focus? You know, am I exposing long enough? Am I at the correct ISO? All of those different things matter. Once you master those techniques, then you can really start to focus on the creative side of things, right? And really focus on what do I want this composition to look like? And that really is the evolution of photography for I think anybody interested in it. Well, we have a little time left and we have some questions from our listeners that were submitted who uh, wanted to know some things from our astrophotography expert. So we're gonna throw some of those at you now, if that's okay. Sure, sure. <laughs> Great. So the first one is from Sam in Boulder. He says, are there any particular impactful or historic astrophotography pieces? Well, certainly the ones that come to mind are the obvious ones. When you look at images that come from Hubble, um, and obviously I'm talking about deep sky related objects. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that those are the ones that resonate with everybody. Um, from a historical significance standpoint, there are some very famous photographers that have taken a number of images. For example, Peter Lick is a very well-known photographer. Um, he's done a lot of night sky work. Some of his work has been purchased by very famous individuals for millions of dollars. Um, but by and large, no, I'm not as familiar with any historical significance associated with night sky photography other than what we see through great instrumentation like Hubble. Now, Mac from Boston is asking, when NASA discovers something in space, say a new exoplanet, what kind of information and precedents do astrophotographers and artists use to create artists' interpretations of discoveries? So when you go to a NASA website and you see a picture and it says, this is an artist's interpretation of what we think is there. Are you familiar with that at all? Yeah, I, you know, I've seen those kind of um, um, things before. And I think what it does for me, Colin, is it, it sparks more of the creative side, right? I mean, I, I think through artist renditions of what does this exoplanet look like or what might it look like? And then I start to think through the creative side of, well, how would I try to capture that if I had a lens you know, powerful enough to be able to do that? I love you know, those kind of renditions of things. Um, but I think the hard part for me in particular, since I do so much um, photography that is more through the digital SLR as opposed to deep sky photography, photography through a telescope, um, it's, it's harder for me to think through how I might capture that exoplanet. Um, and obviously the instrumentation that I have wouldn't be powerful enough to do it anyway. I'd have to have access to a very powerful observatory. And as Tara noted earlier, it's hard to get time <laughs> on those. And certainly amateurs like me wouldn't get access to that. Do general, like people like yourself, amateurs or advanced amateurs, do you ever shoot in non-visible light? Um, give me an example. Um, say, do you have anything capable of, say, shooting the Milky Way in ultraviolet or oh, infrared, infrared or something like that? Yeah, I really don't. I, I my, my equipment isn't that powerful. Um, I think those are things that are oftentimes left to the professional photographers that do have access to that kind of instrumentation. I am familiar with some of those capabilities, but mostly through the universities, since they have time on the bigger telescopes. Are there any consumer electronics that you're aware of that are capable of that? I mean, could someone go out and buy some sort of, of infrared sensitive DSLR, or is that not really a product on the market? I'm not aware of that being something that's available um, from a from a mass production, you know, general population, uh, something that, that the general population could buy. I have to believe that that kind of instrumentation would be fairly expensive, but it would be cool to get access to it because I think it would allow for <laughs> some fairly interesting capabilities that uh, maybe we haven't seen to date that have come through, you know, primarily academic institutions. Absolutely. So Florian from Stuttgart is asking, when photographing extremely low light skies, how do you account for the rotation of the earth with long exposure time? It's an absolutely great question. It's fundamental to night sky photography. And I oftentimes get asked, you know, how long did you expose that image for when you took it? 
And I always tell people, well, it depends on the lens that I use. So the wider angle lens you use, the more time you have before the Earth's rotation actually starts to blur the image. For example, if you shoot with a 14 millimeter lens, which is a very wide angle lens, almost a fisheye lens, you have roughly 30 seconds to capture the night sky with that lens before you start to get movement in the stars, any meaningful movement in the stars. And as you go to lenses that are not as wide, obviously you do a 24 millimeter, 35 and so on, um, the exposure times get much, much shorter. And you have to account for that when you're doing night sky photography or you're gonna wind up with a lot of blurry images. Now, the only exception to that would be if you're interested in doing star trails. And I think we've all seen images where uh, people have you know, focused cameras on Polaris, you know, mostly um, in that direction. And they purposely open the lens um, for or the camera for an hour or two or three and try to get as long as if exposure as possible and you're able to see those circular motions. And that's a very, usually a very intentional process. Do you have uh, like, tracking technology like we use with telescopes that help keep you centered on your object or do you have to do all that manually? Um, I do it manually. Um, there are instruments that you can purchase. There are trackers and I think they're becoming more popular and more affordable. There are a couple that are available that are less than about a thousand dollars and they will allow you to expose longer and I think that would be certainly beneficial and intriguing to use but it is a matter of investment. And, you know, I've chosen mostly to invest in good quality lenses and other types of equipment that will enable me to do my capture. Um, but I can see a point in time in the not too distant future where, you know, I will make an investment in a tracking capability for my digital SLR. And a lot of those instruments, Tara, they, they're available to be used both with the telescope as well as the digital SLR camera. So we have one from Charlotte from Austin, always with the great questions. She wants to know, what image of yours are you most proud of and what image of someone else's inspires you? <laughs> well, um, I've had the good fortune of, of shooting the night sky from a lot of different locations. Probably the most popular image and the one that I've so, sold the most of is an image from Arches National Park. It's actually a double arch. It's on my website. It's one of the most prominent images that's out there. Um, that particular image um, was taken about four or five years ago, and uh, I got a really great um, image of the foreground where we light painted the foreground so we could illuminate the rock and the arch, and then the night sky above it was the Milky Way moving in the same direction as the arch. So that's probably the most popular and probably the one that, uh, that I gravitate to. Um, the most, but maybe that's just because of the popularity. But probably the next thing that I would say related to that is the next object I'm going to shoot is my favorite because that's the one I'm planning for next. And the, the, a good example was this past summer when we had uh, Comet Neowise. And we had a lot of um, challenging night skies because we had a lot of cloudy evenings when it was visible from Denver. And I wound up going about two hours directly east of Denver to a place called Linden, Colorado, and shooting back toward. Uh, the portion of the sky where it was visible and it was one of my favorite captures or one of my most, you know, favorite recent captures. I love that that is, that seems very noble and artistic, that the next object you're going to shoot is your favorite. I like that a lot. Cool. Yeah. Our... Go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, I was going to move on to another question. So if you had something you wanted to add, Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, I think... It... You know, from a photographer's perspective, it almost always is. Most people would probably answer the question that it really is the next object they're going to shoot because they're planning it right now, right? They're thinking about it. I've got some locations that are coming up this year that I'm really looking forward to shooting from, and I'm trying to plan those in my mind's eye. It's not even just necessarily using applications or, a star, you know, a star map or something like that. I'm actually in my mind's eye trying to think about the right kind of capture and can I get it the way that I want to get it? And so that really is why it's probably my favorite. So our producer, John, actually typed this question into our questions document as we were speaking. And John wants to know, do you use any image stacking or are all your photographs single exposure images? No, I definitely do stacking. And you, the, the more um, experienced you get, um, most people want to do everything they can to eliminate noise. So one of the things that, that enables that, and obviously John probably understands this pretty well, when you shoot multiple images of the exact same thing, 
and you stack those and you stack them correctly and they get properly aligned, you're able to eliminate a lot of noise and bring a lot of tremendous clarity to the image. And it has become a very popular technique to be able to capture the stars at night that way and then blend that with a foreground, right, that is the exact same location, but expose it for a different length of time. So the way I typically will shoot is I will stack, I will shoot 25 or 30 images of the night sky. I will stack those together. I will change the settings on my camera, but I won't move my camera. I'll leave it in the exact same position, but I'll expose for a lot longer so that I can illuminate the foreground. And then using a photo editor like Adobe Camera Raw or Photoshop, you can blend those two together and you get incredibly beautiful sky with an illuminated foreground. And that's the kind of work that I think you're starting to see more and more photographers do. Very cool. And hey, I have a question that has been in my mind kind of since we got on, and I figured Capcom was a good time to ask. In the image behind you, there is a bright object. It, from my perspective, it's just to the right of the Milky Way. I don't know if it's, if it's flipped or not, but there's a bright object there. What is that? Yeah, so a little bit of background about that image. There's a couple of things in the image. I know your, your viewers won't be able to see this, but um, this image was shot in Yellowstone National Park uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, I shot it in July. It was over the 4th of July, as a matter of fact. And uh, this particular location is in West Yellowstone near the fire hole for those people that have spent some time in Yellowstone National Park. And by the way, Yellowstone is one of the most amazing locations, not just during the night sky, obviously, or to see the night sky, but during the day just to enjoy the park. But it's one of my favorite locations to shoot. This particular image, um, the object you're talking about on the right is Jupiter. So you have the galactic center of the Milky Way in this image. Um, you have Jupiter just to the right. And what you can't see very well uh, would be a little further in the same direction as Jupiter is uh, a meteor is going through. So this image is on my website. People can get a better perspective of that. Um, the other thing that I'll share about this image, it was kind of interesting. And this is where you get lucky. You were asking earlier about light pollution. Um, this particular image was shot very close to a road, and there was a car driving by at the time I was exposing this image. And it just so happens that it illuminated the tops of some of the trees um, right exactly in the same alignment as the Milky Way galaxy. So I kept that when I produced this image. And I've had a lot of people say, was it the Milky Way that was illuminating those trees? And the answer is no, it was a car driving by. So sometimes you just get really lucky with the capture. And sometimes it works to your advantage, you know, for as much as we, uh, we don't want light pollution or other sources of light impacting our image, you never know. You just have to be flexible. Man, that is a great story. That's awesome. Cool. Well, I think that that wraps it up. Tara, are there any questions that you wanted to ask coming from Tara and Boulder? I think they covered pretty much everything that I that I had. Perfect. Well, in that case, uh, Sherp, it has been such a pleasure to speak with you. Thanks so much for being on the show. Well, thank you so much. And uh, I hope that this has helped some of your listeners and um, encourage people to, to pursue photography of the night sky. I'm sure it has. Very good. You take care. You, you too. too Thanks again. Bye bye. Well, that wraps things up for this episode of A View from Earth. We would like to thank Sherp again for joining us today. It was such a good time talking to him. And uh, we also want to ask our listeners to check back in next week for a conversation with Dr. Beth Osnes uh, on climate science and the power of performance in science communication and resilience. Uh, we'd also like to invite everyone to visit our website, www.colorado.edu forward slash FISC, all sorts of good things to do there from checking out uh, future or past episodes of the podcast to submitting any questions you might have for our professionals. Um, and another great thing you can do from there is to make a donation. Uh, if, if this podcast is important to you, uh, we would really appreciate your financial help. Um, finally, uh, make sure to comment and subscribe on our uh, various channels of communication to make sure that you don't miss anything. Um, and we'd like to thank you for listening. <laughs>